Oh, so the seminar can be in, there's no hard time constraint. Uh -huh. uh, we have 90 minutes in any case. Yeah, I don't know whether I'll need 90 minutes. We'll see. <laughs> it means it, it, short, short, short is also totally fine. Even, even better, actually. <laughs> Everyone can go. <laughs> It'll take your time, but for 90 minutes. You Are you guys doing any uh, in person seminars yet? Oh, in person. I think, uh, let me think. Let me see. Some of them, not, not, not many, but uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's more, more and more, possibly more. Yeah, same here. Oh, great. So let me also start recording and then we can start. Welcome everyone to Harvard CMSA Quantum Matter in Math and Physics seminar series. It is our great honor to have Professor Simon Cattero from Syracuse University. He will be speaking about his recent work on anomalies and the symmetric mass generation with Keller Dirac fermions. Let me re remind the audience, please feel free. If you find the time appropriate, you can ask questions or in interact with Simon. So oh, yes. Simon, please take away. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Yuvan. Um, it's nice to be here again. Um, I guess I talked about related work about a year ago. And so hopefully this will uh, not overlap too much with what I spoke about last year. Um, and yes, do stop me. I have plenty of time. I only have 20 some slides. So there's plenty of time in an hour and a half to, to go slowly and to deal with questions. So, so please interrupt me if I say something you don't understand or looks strange to you. All right, so I'm gonna um, start with a sort of puzzle, which, um, you know, arose maybe five, six, seven years ago in some studies uh, of what are called staggered fermions. Uh, these are lattice fermions of a particular stripe. And I'll say a little bit more about them as we go along. Uh, and, the, and the puzzle was that you were, it, it seemed it was possible to generate phases of these uh, staggered fermion models where, the, where fermions picked up masses without breaking any of the exact lattice symmetries. And so that was a sort of a novel feature for a lattice gauge theorist to see usually Massive fermion masses are associated with symmetry breaking. And so this was kind of novel. Um, and we'll see that some of the resolution of that, uh, I think we now understand uh, using continuum methods. Uh, and so particularly we'll see that staggered fermions are a particular discretization of what are called Kähler Dirac fermions. So I'll send some time telling you what Kähler Dirac fermions are, how they relate to ordinary Dirac fermions and how therefore they connect to these staggered lattice fermions that we originally uh, looked at uh, some years ago. And so the key piece of physics, which really you know, gives you a resolution of the problems or the issues, the puzzles that we were seeing with these staggered fermions is that these uh, Kähler Dirac fermions uh, possess new types of gravitational anomaly, uh, which were not really known before. Um, and those things constrain uh, uh, what can happen uh, in the phase diagram of the lattice model. So rather surprisingly, these anomalies survive even under discretization. And that's what's sort of a, a, a novel feature of these systems. So I'll talk a little bit about this gravitational anomaly and, and how it uh, leads to uh, this phenomena of symmetric mass generation, which I sort of alluded to before. Uh, and then I'll, I'll say, talk a little bit about some more recent work involving uh, massive Kähler Dirac fermions in odd dimensions. And I'll show you that when you integrate these guys out, the effective actions you get are basically gravitational actions. Um, and if you do this in the presence of boundaries, then you end up with sort of Kähler Dirac analogs of topological insulators. And there's a sort of an interesting story associated with those guys too, which connects back into the anomaly, of course, in, in even dimensions, the gravitational anomaly I talked about. So this is work done with various students of mine over the last few years. Uh, Newman Bud is now a postdoc in Urbana-Champaign. And the other two guys, Anab and Guksu, are still in Syracuse. All right, so let me first of all start off by telling you what staggered fermions are and what this particular puzzle was that we bumped into in about 2015. So staggered fermions are single component uh, fermions. 
Uh, in, for the model we were interested in, you have four of these guys. So these Chi's, single uh, component Grassmann's, carry a single index, uh, um, which allows them to transform in the fundamental representation of an SO4 group. Okay, so it, if I forget about the four fermion term here, do you guys see my cursor? Okay. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so if I just look at the sort of the hopping term, the kinetic term here, which couples Chi through a symmetric difference operator to Chi, um, this is the standard staggered Fermi in action. It's well known what the continuum limit of this theory is. It describes, uh, in this case, four, if I, if I just have a single copy of chi's, this would describe four Majorana fermions in the continuum limit at g equals zero. And that's true in both three and four dimensions. So these are Euclidean dimensions. So three includes a Euclidean time, that's just four. All right, so this is, a, now what we're doing, of course, when we switch on this second term, this four fermion term, is looking at the phase diagram as a function of G, this four Fermi coupling, all right? And notice that this is basically the simplest four fermion term you can write down. If you only have four Grassmann variables, all you can do is take the product of all four, and that's all this, this term does, all right? So it's the simplest possible four fermion model you could imagine, which describes relativistic fermions, at least in a, the limit where the form of Fermi coupling vanishes. It's actually very surprising. It had never look, been looked at before in the lattice literature, um, but it turns out it hadn't. It describes, because I have four copies of this system, I have, it describes naturally 16 Majorana fermions um, at G equals zero. So the symmetries, it has a, a great uh, number of symmetries. Of course, it has this SO4 symmetry. Uh, sometimes you can enhance this to SU4, but I won't talk about here that here. And in fact, in our case, because of our UCAR interactions, it's, it's restricted to SO4. It has a certain shift symmetry. It can shift these single component Grassmann's by some phase and associated with a single shift of a lattice spacing. Where these phase rules are all written down here. These are well known for staggered fermions. And it has, importantly, this Z4 symmetry, which allows me to basically take the Grassmann and multiply by I epsilon. Epsilon is the lattice site parity. So it tells me whether I have an even site or an odd site. So the lattice, of course, is a cubic or a hypercubic lattice, and it divides naturally into two uh, sub lattices uh, corresponding to even and odd sites. And so I do a different rotation if you want a different transformation on even and odd sites. So it's very easy to see that these symmetries prohibit all the fermion mass bilinear terms you can think about. And so this four Fermi term is the sort of a natural uh, extension of a free theory to an interacting theory. Right. Okay, so this is the, the basics of the model we were playing with um, at the time. It's, um, and so let me show you some results from- Sorry, I think I- Make sure I still follow. Sure. <laughs> Sorry. The first slide, uh, yeah, the earlier slide. Mm -hmm. The way you count 16 Marana is because uh, you have a full component in full component, oh, sorry, full of the fundamental of SO4. Mm -hmm. And however, the, the fundamental has full component. So, so a single chi, a single staggered field actually gives rise to four Majorana fields in the continuum. That's well understood. And mm -hmm. that's, uh, by the lattice community, and it's been known for a long time. So normally a staggered fermion will give you four Dirac in the continuum limit, a single staggered fermion, because I'm doing what are called reduced staggered fermions here. So I don't have a chi and a chi bar, just a single chi. I actually have half the number of degrees of freedom. So two Dirac or four Majorana, but then I have four copies of this whole system. So that gives me the 16. So it's four times four. Okay, let, let me just make sure. Then when you say this in the caption, say 16 continuum, Marana mm -hmm. fermions. What what is how many components of this Marana in the, the space time spinner? So you, it depends whether I'm in three or four dimensions. Three dimensions, right? So these are two. In, uh, in fact, it, it so it's either a two component two, spinner oh. or a four component spinner in four dimensions. Okay, okay, fine. That, that's it. Is that clear? Okay, thanks. Yeah. So the the this, the continuum limit of this theory is extremely well understood at g equals zero, right? And it's just sixteen free continuum Marana spinners in both three and four dimensions. It's not so clear what happens at strong coupling, right? And that's what we'll be interested in. But but let me just make sure. But but the sixteen of this continuum, Mara from they they group into four of the fundamental four of S for four. Is that right? Is yeah, that... I guess so. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's what I ask. Thanks. Right. Okay. So so here's what the phase structure that was puzzling that we observed back in in 2015. Um, so it's very easy to see that if I take G to infinity, I can do a strong coupling expansion. I can show there's a four fermion condensate forms, perhaps not surprisingly. 
Uh, what's more interesting is the fact that in the background of this four fermion condensate, you can compute, again, in strong coupling, the fermion propagator, and you find the fermions pick up a mass. All right, but this condensate breaks no symmetries. So this is a situation where you have apparently generated massive fermions by breaking no symmetries. If I take G to be zero, I know I have massless continuum Majorana fermions. I already know that. So there has to be at least one phase transition between these two regimes. Um, and here's uh, some numerical results which show a particular fermionic susceptibility as a function of um, the coupling. Actually, U is equal to G squared up to some constant here. So it's essentially G squared I'm plotting on the x-axis. And so you see a nice rising peak in some susceptibility between uh, the massless and the massive phases. The insert here is actually the four fermion condensate itself. So you see it's never zero because it's not really an order parameter, breaks no symmetries, but it, it switches on rapidly in the vicinity of the peak. And so these are lattices up to 28 cubed, I guess. And this is work by, by Chilish Chandrasekharan, uh, which was published in 2016. Uh, okay, so this is the first, this is in three dimensions. So if you want two plus one, but we have a Euclidean time dimension. Um, so this, this is interesting. You can compute critical exponents. This has been pushed a little bit harder by now. And those critical exponents are non-trivial and certainly are not sort of Heisenberg-like or anything like that. They, are, they look like novel new critical exponents. Um, this sort of transition, though, or this phase diagram can be pushed up, up into four dimensions where it's more interesting to a particle physicist. You have to generate, generalize the four Fermi term a little bit to a more general higgs yukawa model. So the way we do that is we add a scalar field um, in some representation of SO4, which couples to a fermion bilinear. If I didn't have this kappa term, I could integrate phi out and generate the full Fermi term. That's what we do for the numerical work, of course. In general, I need the kappa term as well. So I have to allow for a kinetic, separate kinetic term for the scalar field at this point too. Otherwise I will in general generate some symmetry breaking bilinear condensates. But if I tune kappa, I can go smoothly as in two dimensions from a weak coupling regime to a strong coupling regime. So this left-hand picture is basically the four fermion condensate. And you see it switches on at some point for different kappas um, from small values to large values. And associated with that switch on, again, there's some sort of peak in the susceptibility and associated fermionic susceptibility, all right? So there's evidence for some sort of direct, uh, no, no this, is, this switch on, by the way, occurs for a very small positive kappa. That's, that's the observation. If you run for a zero kappa, you will actually find a very, very narrow broken phase between the massless and massive symmetric phases. If you tune kappa a little bit, you can move above that uh, and, uh, and find this direct transition. So this is sort of interesting. Again, now we found a, a four dimensional model where apparently you're able to gap the fermions if you're careful without breaking any of the exact lattice symmetries. So this was sort of the initial motivator for me and for a few other people and the lattice community to take these to look at these models more seriously and try to understand what was going on. Um, so usually fermions acquire mass by breaking symmetries. That's the norm. I mean, that can be an explicit breaking. It can be a spontaneous breaking. It can even be an anomalous breaking. So the question, and, and that's what had been seen, higgs yukawa models have been studied by the lattice gauge theory community for many, many years. And, and funnily enough, this particular model had not been looked at. And so while four fermion phases had been seen before, they were always, um, you know, disconnected from the continuum limit by first order phase transitions and phases with broken symmetry and things. And this was the first time that a model had been constructed, which apparently allowed you to go directly between massless and massive phases without passing through a broken uh, symmetry broken phase. So why is the first question is what's different about this model that from the older models that have been looked at before? Oh, uh, excuse me. Actually, yeah. I'm, I'm uh, puzzled by one thing. When you earlier mentioned maybe uh, one one or two slides earlier, say that uh, this interaction term does not break any symmetry, but I think it still breaks some symmetry, possibly just outside the SO4 or other Marana's uh, space. Uh, it, it, well, the, well, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, it doesn't break any of the exact lattice symmetries, right? So it, there may be continuum symmetries, but of course they're already broken by latticeization in the first place. Right, mm -hmm. so I can rotate the fermions and this fundamental of SO4. I can do these shift symmetries on X, which are related to discrete chiral transformations, it turns out. Or I can do this Z4 transformation, and none of those are broken by the appearance of the four fermion condensate. Right. So but, sure but, ones yeah, yes, maybe on the latest it doesn't, but in a continuum limit, I suppose when you introduce those interaction terms, 
it will break some symmetry that has presumably well, mixed, mixed right. enough. So the yeah, initial so puzzle is why we don't manage to do it on the lattice. And it's only with the exact symmetries I can worry about then. What happens in the continuum is, is unclear at this point, right? From what I've told you so far. Um, yeah, that's fine. I, mean, I, just I, I couldn't worry about breaking symmetries that are already broken is what I'm saying. <laughs> right? okay. The latticeization breaks a lot of continuum symmetries. And it's not even clear what the continuum limit of this model looks like, right? This is strictly a lattice model at this point. Okay. Uh, let me also just make sure, just for the audience, I think most people don't know Stegger fermions. So what, what is different between this Stegger fermion, for example, with like domain wall fermions? What's a rule um, model for Stegger fermion, not just oh, usual so, regularization? Right. So I'm going to tell you a lot more about them in a moment, because I'm going to tell you how they relate to Kähler Dirac fermions, which are formulated directly in the continuum. So we'll talk about that in a moment. But roughly speaking, these things are used have been used extensively in the lattice QCD community for doing QCD. So you can take the Dirac action, you can put it on a lattice in a sort of naive way, and then you can try to diagonalize the spinner interactions using unitary transformations, which depend on the lattice sites. And when you do that, you get this thing called the staggered action, which is basically what we're looking at here. Um, uh, and that has a lot of technical advantages over doing things like naive fermions or domain wall fermions, because computationally, these are only one component objects. They have a very local action, so they're very efficient to simulate with Monte Carlo. So they were used a lot, particularly in the early days of QCD. But even recently, there are some of the biggest lattices that are used for QCD use staggered fermions, basically. So they are thought to, naively, most of the lattice gauge theorists consider them as just discretizations of Dirac fermions. I'll tell you today that I don't think that's perhaps the the best way of thinking about them. They are more closely related to these things called Kähler Dirac fermions. So I'll say much more about that as we, we go along. Okay, and, but these are mainstream lattice no gauge theory fermions. But, but, but when the degree of freedom somehow will be uh, double or quadruple in some way in, in this state of so, fermions? So you can think about it when you do naive fermions, you know you get a lot of fermion doubling. And what, so for, for example, in four dimensions, you'll end up with 16 Dirac fermions if you discretize the Dirac equation in a naive way. So you get this huge replication in the number of, uh, they call it tastes these days, but just basically the number of flavors of fermion that are propagating light in the lattice. Staggered fermions get rid of factor, a factor of four. So they bring it down from 16 Dirac fermions to four Dirac fermions. So they always describe a multiple of fermions um, uh, which is not one, right? So you can't get down to one fermion with staggered fermions. Um, and I don't know whether I'm answering your question. I, I mean, some, I think some part of this talk will be to tell you that those conventional ways of thinking about staggered fermions aren't really precise enough to capture all the physics. And there's a much better way of thinking of staggered fermions. And that's what I'll get on to. So, Thank you. so I don't want to play a very strong role advocating for them in the context of conventional lattice gauge theory, because I think the, the conventional interpretation is not strictly correct. It may be okay. It, there may be a limit in which it's correct, but it's not the best way to think about them. Thanks. Okay, so they're good. That's fine. Anyway, I don't mind having lots of questions. It's useful because I don't know what this audience knows. Um, anyway, so, um, okay. So, so I have this lattice model where apparently the fermions can pick up masses without breaking any of the exact lattice symmetries. And I don't really understand at this point why that's the case, What's why it's different from all the other staggered lattice models and Higgs-Yukawa models that have been looked at over several decades. And, and the question is, what's the nature of the phase transition here? There's no order parameter, so it's certainly not a Landau-Ginsberg type analysis. It's something more exotic than that, presumably has some sort of topological flavor. Um, so I'm, I'm looking ahead to where we'll go to, uh, I'll show you that staggered fermions really should be best thought of as arising from a discretization of something called a Kähler-Dirac equation or the Kähler Dirac fermions. So I'll tell you a bit about that. And then I can do the analysis for Kähler Dirac fermions, both in the continuum on the lattice and on the lattice. And I'll see they have a they, they exhibit a gravitational anomaly, which is not the usual anomaly of vial fermions coupled to gravity. And the, the most important feature of that is that anomaly survives intact when you discretize it if you do it in the right way. And so it's that anomaly which is driving the, the novel physics of this lattice model in the end. It breaks a global U1 symmetry down to a Z4. It's, uh, and the four fermion term that we wrote down originally in our original model, of course, is consistent with that Z4, which is why we're actually in, able to drive symmetric mass generation with it. And canceling off a Z4 anomaly is going to be key 
to symmetric mass generation. So that's just lo looking to the to where we'll get to. Um, no, actually, let me ask. I think uh, it's, it's it's faster than me. I can make sure I really understand. I think maybe some audience can know. Uh, can I go back to this Yukawa Higgs term? Yeah, the, the rewriting. Do you, a do you, there, right? I haven't written all the. No problem. Here. Is this a, like a, uh, like a mean field condensate of the Higgs or of this older Higgs or? So, so if I set if I set kappa to zero, I can just integrate the phi out, right? It's what you would call a Hubbard Stratanovich transformation or something, right? So I would just get the my four Fermi term from that. But if I keep kappa non-zero, I can no longer integrate out the phi to get a pure four Fermi term. It's more exotic than that. I need this, right? A kinetic this kinetic term um, changes the physics a little bit right but the, but the, the this phi term also has kinetics so i suppose depends on the face of the higgs field if yeah, it's yeah. Less, when you there, are, there are many I, I didn't show you a picture of the full phase diagram it's quite exotic there are ferromagnetic phases anti-ferromagnetic phases the four fermion condensate phase massless phases so there is it's quite a complicated phase diagram but it uh, basically, from our perspective, the main thing is that there is a region where I can pass continuously, apparently, between the massless and massive symmetric phases without encountering bilinear condensates and things of that nature. Yes. Okay, great. So, so how about... The numerical how... result, we don't have an analytic argument for it, particularly as a, there are some thoughts, but not really a hard argument. So how do we read it, this uh, horizontal uh, vertical axis of the this diagram? Uh, this uh, which one? The right-hand one? Both. I, I'm, uh, I think there's on transition, but well, the, the left hand, the left hand picture is showing you the four Fermi condensate. So I can still measure that, right, in my Monte Carlos. These are done with a hybrid, rational hybrid Monte Carlo algorithm. So the left hand picture shows you the four Fermi condensate as a function of g. The right one, actually, it's I realize it's actually a proxy for the susceptibility. You can do the susceptibility as well. It looks exactly the same. This is actually the number of uh, conjugate gradient iterations per trajectory, which is sort of a proxy for the peak. Looks like. All right, so um, so you find a, a sharp peak in some fermionic susceptibility, basically around G of one, exactly where the full Fermi condensate switches on strongly. Um, so, so the susceptibility is a derivative of some order parameter respect to what? Right, so it's basically a derivative of a bilinear fermion with respect to a source or something like that. So it's a four fermion term, chi, 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 but with two of them separated. So I have a chi, chi at the origin, say, and a chi, chi at some other point in the lattice, it's the correlation of function of those two guys integrated. Uh, uh, respect to derivative, respect to variation of uh, which, which, which so, so let, yes. let, uh, there are various me. ways of writing okay. it down. So I can have a source term which couples to a bilinear in the action and say it's basically I guess, yes. that yes. source. I, I get or it. I can just think of it as a correlation function which is integrated. I get it. I get it. Separation. And okay. in fact, what I'm showing you here, it looks like is actually a proxy for that. It's actually a different uh, observable, but the, that plot, I assure you, looks just the same as this one, which is why I grabbed the wrong plot, it looks like. Uh, and also, should I see the two-point fermion operator correlation function on one side has the poly, poly, polynomial decay? So it has to, the peak. Yeah. It's the the other, no, the, okay. Mm -hmm. But I, I, should I see the other side's exponential decay to, to see a gap phase? Yes. Yes, so you'll find that the correlator is gapped on one on both sides. Well, no, on certainly on the right hand side. No, on right hand, -hand side. side it, in the infrared, it renormalizes to a free theory. So I think it's gapless, but trivial on the left hand side. Right. So the correlation behavior is different. The, the, left, the left hand side is polynomial. Is it like one over so, x? So it will be if you want. It's a free theory at weak coupling for g less than g critical. Uh, it's a gap theory for G greater than G critical, and right at the critical point, there's some non-trivial power law behavior. Right. And compare, these are the, your, your work in this slide, compare with the uh, Zhang Zhong Sanka, Zhang Zhong Sanka, mm -hmm. there's a previous slide. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, the, so the statement is that you see result agree with each other? Is no, that, well, uh, they, they only simulated the theory for cap equals zero. So they find, and they found before us, in fact, a very, very narrow. You, what you see is a, what looks like a single peak. But if you hone in on that peak, you find that it's actually bounding. It's actually two peaks which are merged together because they're so close together in coupling. So what you find, if you look carefully, is there's a very small broken Fermi bilinear condensate at right near in the middle of the peak. So that's what Shailish found originally. Um, 
and you only are able to, to get a direct transition. So, so there's a broken phase between the massless and massive phases, if you want, in, in the original work with a pure four Fermi term in four dimensions. But if you in, add this coupling kappa, which you should do, it's a marginal operator. It should be in, in the analysis. It, it's inconsistent to leave it out. If you do that, uh, then you can tune to a point where that bilinear phase goes away and you go directly from massless to massive. Okay, so Shailish doesn't have any data because the algorithm he's using doesn't allow him to set kappa non-zero. But, but does he, uh, does he the affect that uh, you want to access the symmetry gap phase, symmetry mass generation phase? Yeah. And uh, does, does he also obtain that? Yes. Uh, yes he, there is a gap phase in his work, right? He just, the problem for him is the gap phase is separated from the continuum by a broken phase. I see. So it's not clear how to take the continuum limit in that phase. It may just be a lattice artifact if you want. So <laughs> what we are showing here is there's a really way, a way, way potentially to take the continuum limit at this. So this is a non-trivial fixed point in four dimensions for pure for, for self-interacting fermions, right? which is interesting in of itself without respect to anything else. Thank you very much. That, that helps. I, I have another comment. So there's a critical coupling, the capital G maybe around one point something, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think uh, this phenomenon should be true, but uh, I don't know whether any of you verifies that when the G coupling is too large, it might go back to the gap please phase again. I don't I know. I think so, because it's in the strong coupling limit, I can prove that I get a full fermion condensate. It's just a, uh, uh, you know, I can do the Grassmann integrals directly at strong coupling. So I don't think you ever go back to the massless phase, a very strong G with this model. Maybe maybe this might be model dependent. Uh, certainly, yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I don't know exactly true, but in some cases, if coupling is too strong, uh, you know, the non perturbative physics usually is you you have you you cannot do perturbation, right? So the capital G is small. Certainly, it's perturbative physics. You cannot gap the gap the gap this fermion to get a symmetry gap SMG or symmetry mass phase. Mm -hmm. However, if the G capital G is too large, you can still do maybe one over G perturbations and the kinetic energy in comparison is much smaller or interaction is much stronger. That's in, that case, limit, right? And right. in that case, actually, it's again, go back to one over G perturbative physics. In that case, it's possible the uh, mirror on in this, your, your theory may not have a mirror, but anyway, in, in, in that case, the, the fermion might, be, might become uh, yeah, actually, I think the, the difference might be that uh, if the if the if the if the if 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 they if they have some degree of freedom become gap, there they could be extra degree of freedom become gapless in a scenario of like a mirror mirror theory mirror from yeah theory. yeah Here okay we have no mirror states yeah, that, 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 that might be a different but I, but I, I still I still. I still wonder whether it's possible in, in your model that there could also be similar behavior. Maybe not. Yeah. I don't see how it can happen here. Yeah. I mean, okay. Right. Okay, that's a different. Thanks. All right. Thank you. So, uh, let's see. Okay, so so what I need to do at this point is tell you a little bit about Kaled or Rack fermions. So they just pose an alternative solution to the problem of squaring the Laplacian, the problem that Dirac faced back in 1920, whenever it was, eight, whenever it was, he came up with the Dirac equation. He was looking to square the Laplacian essentially. And so, you know, that's, that's the old story you read in the textbooks, but it turns out there's another solution to that problem. So instead of um, writing uh, down gamma matrices, one can use the exterior derivative and its adjoint and construct an operator which is linear in derivatives, which actually naturally also squares to the Laplacian built out of D minus D dagger. And so that's the basic idea uh, of the Kähler Dirac equation is just to write down a first order equation in D and D dagger such that this operator squares to box, all right? And now this thing has to naturally act on forms, right? Because it's an exterior derivative. And in fact, it has to be a, act naturally on a collection of P forms, right? It has to go for the, the uh, I have to, I can't restrict to a single P form. I have to go from zero up to D, the dimension of the space time, right? So this is a natural um, guess, if you want, for an equation which would describe fermions which in principle is distinct from the ordinary Dirac equation, right? And this thing was written down in the 1960s at some point uh, by, by Mr. Kaler, I guess, um, as an alternative to the Dirac equation. 
But of course, it's not unrelated to the Dirac equation in some sense, uh, particularly in flat space. So if I take these forms that make up one of these Kähler Dirac fields, so there's a scalar, a vector, an antisymmetric tensor, um, rank two tensor, and I use those to form up a matrix. So basically I take products of gamma matrices indexed by the integers which index the, the form itself and sum those guys up from zero to D. I can form a, say for example, in four dimensions, a four by four matrix capital Psi. All right. So from this collection of forms, which are meant to be solutions of the Kähler Dirac equation, I can build this four by four matrix Psi. And then I can show that the matrix of Psi actually satisfies the conventional Dirac equation. All right, so in other words, I can think of every column of Psi, there are four of them in four dimensions, as giving a solution, a degenerate solution to the original Dirac equation, at least in flat space. All right, so in flat space, these, the solutions of these Kähler, this Kähler Dirac equation describes multiples of ordinary Dirac fermions. All right, that's at least in the free theory. And uh, that's, that's, that's the claim, that's the, that's the statement. So you can just go through this exercise of building these products of gamma matrices, expanding psion products of them using these coefficients and just show you it will satisfy the ordinary Dirac equation, all right? So I, it describes not one Dirac fermion, but four in four dimensions. In fact, in general, it's two to the power D over two. All right, so it's an alternative to the Dirac equation. And in flat space, it just describes multiples of Dirac fermions. However, in curved space, the story is a little different. The actual Kähler Dirac equation, right, just involves tensors and exterior derivatives. So it remains completely unchanged in curved space, right? I just use the appropriate exterior derivatives for my curved manifold, right? But the structure of the equation doesn't change at all. Um, if I want to write it in matrix form, then I have to introduce a spin connection omega and a frame E. And so the structure becomes a little bit more complicated. But the, what you should notice is that this, if I look at this matrix form of the Kähler Dirac equation, it is not four copies of the usual uh, equation for Dirac fermions in curved space, which would involve basically the spin connection acting on the spin of psi. Here I get a commutator structure of omega with it psi, which is crucial for some of the physics later on we'll, I'll talk about. All right, so the, so the coupling to gravity is not the same as it would be for Dirac fermions. That's not surprising. I, if I replace spinners, by tensors, the coupling of tensors to gravity is clearly not the same as that of spinners, right? So the key thing is that, uh, so, so, so let me back up for a second. So Kähler rack fermions are very natural in curved space. They don't require all the structure of spin connections and, and frames. You can just write down the same equation you did in, in flat space, basically. The couplings to gravity are therefore different from those of ordinary Dirac fermions, although they may only differ from Dirac fermions by terms which are suppressed by, say, the Planck scale. So you won't necessarily know whether you have a Kähler Dirac equation, a Kähler Dirac fermion or Dirac fermion in your hand just by coupling it to gravity because the corrections are typically suppressed by powers of the Planck scale. Nevertheless, it's different in principle and that's important for later on. Um, they are very natural in curved space because I don't need uh, all the spin structure I would otherwise need for Dirac fermions. So I can write a Kähler Dirac equation down on any smooth or even as we'll see simplicial manifold uh, without restriction all right so it, so in some sense it when in the context of quantum gravity there are, there are some advantages to this right because you have a much when you want to integrate over all possible metrics uh it's much easier to do it with Kähler Dirac fermions than with Dirac fermions where the other constraints come into play so that's one thing coupling to gravity is different the second thing that's rather important for what we're going to talk about is that the, these Kähler Dirac fermions um, have a uh, uh, come up, come along with a certain linear operator I'll call up gamma, which just flips the sign of the form according to whether the form is even or odd. So it's a very, very simple operator, but you can show that it anti-commutes with the k Dirac operator very easily. Uh, can I add a question? Sure. Uh, when you say that you don't need all the condition for the Dirac, uh, for the Dirac frame on, on curve space, do you mean that you don't need the orientation of the manifold? Um, do I mean that? Uh, I don't, yes, I think, I believe they, you can do it on non-orientable manifolds too. But what I meant was even more restrictive than that, actually, was simply that you didn't uh, uh, need to be able to erect a, a local frame at each point on the manifold where you could uh, write gamma matrices as, you know, in terms of frames times flat space gammas. 
right? You don't need any of that structure to write down D and D dagger, right? That's just, uh, all you need is a notion of derivative acting on tensor. So you don't have to carry around with you all those local copies of Lorentz frames. And only, you know, and we know that only certain manifolds admit that. So I don't need that for killer Dirac fermions. I see. So, so when you, like you, 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 you packing the manifold and when you go around, you don't need to have the orientation for, for this structure, right? Because you, mm -hmm. you don't I think that's right. I'm not, I don't feel confident replying too much about non-orientable manifolds, uh, but I believe that's the case. Certainly you don't, you can write the equation down. You, you can find solutions on manifolds which don't admit Dirac fermions, even if they're orientable. Thank you. Well, may I ask? I think here so far it's just a continuum killer theorem. I'm in the continuum right now. Yes. Yes. And a question about when you earlier mentioned simplicial geometry, what do you really mean there? I I'll you tell mean, you in a moment. I'm just about to get to that. You mean simplicial complex? For example, yeah. Okay, so it can be discretizing on some visual complex. Right. There's a very natural discretization of all of the. Of, this is the key from the perspective of the lattice, if you want, that this, this equation, unlike the Dirac equation, admits a very natural discretization in which a lot of structure survives in the discrete form, including, as we'll see, the anomaly structure. That's really what's really important. Okay, so, thank you very much. If you're a lattice physicist, these are, these are much more natural than Dirac fermions. <laughs> and also, I suppose. I certainly don't expect uh, you see this, but uh, I suppose there is also require the manifold to be spin manifold. I, I suppose for this. Frame. No, you don't require it to be a spin manifold. That's really? The point. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. so there's a much wider class of manifolds you can formulate Keller Dirac theories on. I mean, I will mostly be talking about spin manifolds. I mean, all right, right. But pretend, and I've written down an equation for the in the matrix form, which assumes that. But I can write the first line down, even if I can't write the second. Mm -hmm. okay. 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 None of that will be terribly important for what we have to say today, but it's just to, for reference. Right. I, um, I saying that you can put on non-spin manifold means like you can include more extra background field. For example, U1, you can have a spin C or some mm -hmm. other spin, yeah. spin structure with yeah, some. I so. Yeah, mm -hmm. thanks. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So, so anyway, what we're really going to focus on is this operator gamma, which just flips the sign of a form. It's a very trivial kind of operation, but it does anti it with K. And of course, it generates an exact U1 symmetry for the massless action because I can just exponentiate basically either the I capital gamma and use that as a times some parameter alpha. And just because it anti commutes with K, it's just like the ordinary chiral operator. I can show that action's invariant under that sort of quasi chiral symmetry. It's not the usual chiral symmetry. In some texts, you'll find it called a twisted chiral symmetry. It's not the usual guy, but it just act, but it acts in a similar way. It anti commutes with K. And so I can write down what looks like a chiral, sort of chiral transformation on the Kähler Dirac fields. All right. And that's going to be key for what we talk about later. All right. Um, I'll actually be talking also about uh, specifically about what are called reduced Kähler Dirac fermions. So let me just give you a uh, definition of that. Using this uh, this gamma operator, I can construct projectors, which are again are analogous to chiral projectors, but they aren't chiral projectors. And if the mass is zero, I can easily show that this Kähler Dirac action splits into two independent components. Basically, the, the phi minuses couple to a phi bar pluses and the phi pluses coupled to phi bar minuses, all right? Which allows me to throw one of them away and talk about a reduced Kähler Dirac theory in which I keep only say phi minus and therefore phi bar plus, all right? So it maps between phi mi the plus and minus sectors in the same way that the ordinary Dirac operator maps between left and right-handed fermions. So this is quite analogous to the decomposition of a massless Dirac field into two vial fields, all right? Um, I can write down a matrix form of this uh, action. Um, so again, it's just a D slash that goes in the center. It maps between psi plus and psi minus. These are these matrices I introduced before built from the forms. And the way you construct the projector on these matrices is you left and right multiply by an ordinary gamma five. So it's a little bit like acting on the left with a chiral gamma five, except you simultaneously have to act on the right of the matrix with the, if you want to flavor gamma five. So I'm doing rotations in both Lorentz indices and also in these sort of additional flavor indices, which enumerate the copies of the Dirac field 
that are built into the Kaler Dirac field, at least in flat space. So this gamma in that sense is sort of a, a direct product of two gammas. The ordinary gamma five you're familiar with and a gamma five associated with the SO4 flavor symmetry, basically. But notice these, these theories are naturally massless. If I write, if I try to square this, this matrix down and take its trace to get a mass term, I get zero, of course, for one flavor. So again, it's a rather somewhat similar to the normal vial fermion situation. And in the continuum limit, it will describe half as many fermion, fermionic degrees of freedom as the full uh, Kähler Dirac theory, right? So there's going to be a mapping between reduced Kähler Dirac fermions and reduced staggered fermions in the end. They sort of have the same name. And, and so the counting works in a similar way. So I'm just putting that up front because we'll, we'll refer to this later on again. Right. So it, the, the theories you were most interested in are most are best thought of as formulated in terms of reduced Kähler Dirac fermions, which are naturally massless objects and hence naturally associated with anomalies for that matter. All right, so, so how do I, the important part of all, about all of this is that it, it rather naturally generalizes to the lattice, as I said. So I can approximate, if you want, any continuum manifold by some sort of simplicial complex, some oriented triangulation. Um, let's see, whoops, what's going on here? Um, Sorry, I can for another question. I just want to make sure when you mentioned reduced Kelly rock, mm -hmm. does degree of freedom change? Yes, or do you still half, it carries half the number of degrees of freedom. I took, I, der I, I can expand the massless Kehler Dirac action on, and, and it separates into two pieces when the mass is zero. I throw one of those pieces away and keep, keep the other. It's analogous to taking a Dirac fermion, decomposing into left and right-handed pieces and throwing away one of those pieces to get a vial action. But, but at least we'll be changing the vector like non chiral theory to a chiral theory? No, it's still vector like. It just, so originally, the Kähler Dirac theory described four Dirac fermions in four dimensions. So the reduced guy will describe two Dirac fermions in four dimensions now, or if you want, four Majorana. Okay, no problem. And if you see that, sort of, it's already telling you the counting is very similar to the staggered fermion model. And I'll show you that explicitly in a little bit. Okay. Thank you. All right, so the point is you can, you, anyway, you can take this uh, continuum theory and put it on an arbitrary random triangulation, all right? So a bunch of D simplices in D dimensions glued pairwise along faces. I can talk about P simplices, which are sets of vertex labels, um, which tell you about particular objects in that lattice. I can place the continuum P forms on P simplices. Uh, these are sometimes called P cochains, right? From a lattice perspective, it's obvious. You just put the p-forms on the p-simplices. What else could you do? D and D dar have D and D dagger have analogs uh, of the boundary and co-boundary operators. These act naturally on simplices to create, for example, if it acts on if delta acts on a, a p-simplex, which has p plus one vertices, all it does is it gives you all the boundary components, all the p minus one simplices that intersect along the boundary, together with some signs that are given by the orientation. And so it turns out that the discrete, you can show that the discrete Kähler Dirac action is just like the continuum guy, except I swap D and D dagger uh, for delta and delta bar, these boundary and co-boundary operators. And I replace the continuum set of P forms by this lattice field, which is basically a P coach, set of P cochains. Or if you want just a bunch of P forms living on various P simplices in the lattice. You can show that there's no fermion doubling then the solutions of this lattice equation go smoothly into the solutions of the continuum Kähler Dirac equation. There's no additional doubling associated with uh, discretization, right? The Kähler Dirac equation didn't describe one Dirac fermion in four dimensions, it described four. The lattice one also describes four in the continuum limit. There's no mismatch there. And what's really important is the zero mode structure is completely exactly reproduced by the lattice theory, by the discrete theory. That's of course key for from the perspective of, of anomalies, right? And this, I don't have time to prove any of this, but this, this, uh, this stuff, which is not new, it was known 20 years ago, is valid for any oriented random triangulation. This is why I'm not sure about the non-oriented. I don't know how to do it for non-oriented triangulations, but certainly for any oriented random triangulation of any topology at all, you can, in other words, if I couple the theory to gravity, the discrete theory to the analog of gravity by formulating an arbitrary curved simplest steel manifold, all of this goes through just in a way completely analogous to the continuum. And this property of gamma is completely unchanged because just flip the sign of the form. 
So it doesn't care whether the form lives on some random triangulation or not. It's completely in. It still anti-commutes with the lattice Dirac operator, Kähler Dirac operator. So all of the structure of the continuum, or most of it, survives under discretization. That that's the key point. Actually, so, sure. Another question, a new question. Can you comment about no formal doubling here? Just in which case, uh, what's the, what, are, what is the intuition so that there, the, so there is wait, no wait, additional doubling? I haven't right? finished. Let, like me, a... let me ask a question yet. I haven't really read. So, uh, what is the intuition behind that? Uh, whether we need to worry about formal doubling? Uh, for example, the, the possibly what what you what the latest people call domain wall fermion. I think we do need to worry fermion doubling if you realize a theory was domain walls presumably jumping from one vacuum to the other, and you might need to go back. In that case, there's a fermion doubling on either side of a domain wall, two domain walls. But when you do latest regularization, uh, what are the intuition behind? Like in which case you need to worry whether there's fermion doubling. I so, suppose there are boundary. So, I mean, there's two aspects to fermion doubling. One is it's just an inconvenience. You get too many fermions and you wanted yes. only one and you get more than you want, 16 or something, if you use naive fermions. So that's, but what's the bigger problem for, for from the perspective of lattice gauge theory is these doublers always come in left and right pairs, right, as you know. So the theory is always a vector. So if you write a theory down in terms of a naive vial field, you'll always find doublers in the spectrum, which are right-handed, say it's a left-handed field, you'll find right-handed fermions in the spectrum too. So the theory is always vector-like. So it's in the context of the nielsen Neomir theorem that this, that this doubling is really painful. It stops you, right, prevents you from writing down a chiral lattice gauge theory, right? Yes. Uh, you know. yeah, so, but, so, so that's the real problem with doubling. Yeah, but, but I'm trying to say, how do you appreciate this fact? Maybe from the way you do that is regularization. Maybe there are different schemes, but uh, one of the reason there's a doubling. I, I understand from the domain world, you know, if you're jumping from vacuum to the others, if you want to have a finite width in the extra dimension, there'll be a doubling. But mm -hmm. it seems like a, a lot of a latest regularization. In a lot of cases, you will get two to some power of a doubler. I, I just want to say, I mean, maybe you do it and you get it. But, 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 huh? Yes, I mean, uh, yes, uh, where, where, the, where do they come from? Other than just do a little calculation, are there some yeah, so I, I would say that in the context of the K Dirac equation, it's sort of obvious. If you built this matrix, right, whose, whose left hand dimension is the size of the spinner, you get a number of flavors which match that, right, because it's a matrix structure that you've created. So you're always going to have this is the two to the D over two, it matches the same the dimension of the spinner in D dimensions. So you will necessarily get that from the Kähler Dirac equation. Um, okay. But by here you say no formal doubling means uh, no extra. No. So in other words, when you discretize the Kähler Dirac equation, you get some discrete set of levels. Those levels go smoothly over into the continuum as you take the lattice spacing to zero. There's no additional states that pop out that weren't there in the continuum equation, right? So the drag equation describes one fermion and when you put it on the lattice naively, it describes 16. That's, it's that mismatch of sort of low energy degrees of freedom, which is the problem that people talk about as fermion doubling, right? In the Kähler Rack case, you're not describing one Fermi, admittedly, you're describing four in four dimensions to start with, but you still only describe four when you discretize. There's no irreversible, uh, there's no, nothing irreversible happens when you introduce a lattice spacing, right? You, of course, it's not exactly the same as the continuum, except for the zero modes, but nevertheless, the solutions go smoothly over into the continuum with no additional sort of replication of flavors or anything like that. that that's all I mean. It describes more than one fermion, it always did, but the discrete equation does no worse than the continuum. They're uh -huh. all vector-like theories at this point. Getting so, so, from a vector like theory to a chiral theory is tricky. The true chiral theory. Yeah. So, so somehow Kilo Dira already in the continuum already cool as much fermion as you need for the latest. Yeah. For, for they, the... they live closer to the lattice theory. That's that's kind of the take home point. Okay, if you're fine, trying thanks. to think if you live on a lattice <laughs> and you're trying to invent fermions, you would naturally invent Kayla Dirac fermions. Not you would not invent the Dirac equation. Thank you. If you want to be fundamentalist about it. Yeah. Thanks. But anyway, okay. They're very closely connected 
as I said, in flat space, but not necessarily on curved spaces. So just to flesh that out a little bit more, I haven't actually told you how to get staggered fermions. I said, this is a general prescription for getting discrete fermions. What about the staggered fermions we started with? Well, it's a similar story. I start off with this matrix, right? This, this four by four matrix, which was uh, representing Kähler-Dirac fermions in, in, that, in that formulation. I can always take my staggered single component fields and use them as coefficients and expansion on gamma matrices, just like we sort of did originally. And I sum over all the, the points in a unit cell of the matrix of the lattice, right? When I do that, if I take that rep representation of epsi and I plug it into this continuum equation uh, for the Kähler Dirac field, right, written in matrix language, I just recover the staggered. Uh, do the traces, I'll just recover the staggered uh, action with these funny staggered phases, which just come from moving gamma matrices around inside the trace and anti-commuting them in appropriate ways. All right. So there's a very close connection between this continuum Kähler Dirac equation written, if you want, in this matrix language and the staggered fermion theory. They are essentially the same. So if I have reduced Kähler Dirac fermions, I can talk about reduced staggered fermions and vice versa. The, the mapping is one-to-one. This, this, by the way, this uh, operator gamma that occurred in the continuum just becomes the site parity operator epsilon in the um, staggered fermion action, right? So th this is so you can think of staggered fermions as simply a particular discretization using this mapping above here uh, of the continuum Kähler Dirac field uh, or the continuum Kähler Dirac equation on, on a regular toroidal hypercubic lattice. So it's very so so the staggered fermions, if you want, only work on a regular lattice. The prescription I gave you before works on any lattice with any topology. If I want to talk about staggered fermions per se, I have to live in flat space and I have to live on a perfectly regular hypercubic or cubic lattice. And then I can just map between the Kähler Dirac equation in discrete form and the staggered equation. Right. So there's an intimate connection between staggered fermions living on flat space. Um, and these continuum Kähler Dirac fields. It's a closer connection than it is to the Dirac equation, I would say. Okay. So let me just recap what I've said so far. I have no idea what the time is because I don't want my watch out. But anyway, um, these staggered fermions are some sort of special discretization of Kähler Dirac fermions, but I can generalize them if you want to arbitrary random curved spaces using this prescription involving uh, the boundary and co boundary operators and and general triangulations. So they are special, they're part of, if you want to put staggered fermions on curved space, in other words, you need to use the more general prescription, right? So the one I gave you before. Um, so in both cases though, these Kähler rack fermions do not suffer from regular chiral anomalies. They fundamentally describe vector-like theories. So the anomaly I'm gonna talk about is not one of the usual chiral anomalies but it do, they do suffer from a new gravitational anomaly. When you formulate them on a random curved background, there's a new anomaly that occurs and you can compute it. You can compute it, as I'll show you, exactly on the lattice. There's no need to even go to the continuum necessarily. And, and so that anomaly survives this synchronization and controls the low energy physics of the lattice model too. So that's gonna be where we're heading. heading. Um, so, so let me do, show you that it's very easy actually. So I'm going to show you the existence of a perturbative anomaly for this U1 symmetry associated with gamma. And I'm going to do it by directly working in the lattice theory because it's actually much easier than doing it in the continuum. You can do it in the continuum too, but it, it's actually more work. It's actually easiest to do it on the lattice. So I showed you before the massless Kähler Dirac action was invariant under one of these um, U1 symmetries associated with gamma. So I know the action's invariant for m equals zero. But the measure may not be invariant, right? The usual story. So if I want to integrate over the Kähler Dirac fields, these are now fields defined on a lattice, all right? So I have a, they have a very specific realization. I have to take the product of all the p-simplices in the lattice. I have a fine of phi bar on each p-simplex. I need to integrate over all of them in the path integral. But I know explicitly how each one of these p-simplices transforms under the measure. It either goes like an e to the i alpha, or an e to the minus i alpha, depending on whether the form is even or odd, whether the simplex is even or odd. So if I just, I can just, enum I can just explicitly enumerate this measure. I can see that every time I have a, like a zero form, 
which transforms like e to the i alpha. Then I get a factor of e to the i alpha times the number of points in the lattice. There's a factor of two because I find a phi bar. Or if I'm on links, I get a contribution e to the minus two i alpha times the number of links, right? So the measure transforms by this obvious phase factor, which you immediately recognize as basically a phase proportional to the Euler characteristic of the lattice of the, of the manifold, all right? Which is defined both in the simplicial triangulation and also in the continuum. So I know so the measure is in fact not invariant in general, even though the action is invariant, the measure is in general not invariant unless the Euler character is zero. So what you realize is for staggered fermions on the torus, actually Euler chi is zero. And so there is no anomaly for staggered fermions directly. But as soon as I generalize to curve space, uh, in general, there will be an anomaly, okay? Um, in fact, in even dimensions, I can always compactify my even dimensional space to some sort of sphere where the Euler character is two. And so I can immediately see that the U1 symmetry I started with, like classical symmetry, is broken to a Z4, right? That's true in the continuum. It's true on the lattice. In odd dimensions, if I do the same thing, uh, it vanishes because the Euler characteristic of an odd dimensional sphere equals zero, all right? So this has anomalies only in even dimensions, sort of like the chiral anomaly too, but it's not the usual chiral symmetry. So I can do this calculation. I just sketched it for you quickly, but it's not much more to flesh it out. You can do it on the lattice or you can do it in the continuum, keeping track of things. And then you get the same answer as you have to. And it's just because the structure survives under discretization. And it's an example of a quantum mechanical anomaly for a finite number of degrees of freedom. I can take a triangulation with only four points in two dimensions, like the basic, the simplest triangulation of the sphere in two dimensions and get the same answer. So it's completely, in, it's only sensitive to the topology of the lattice um, and doesn't require an infinite number of degrees of freedom. So the folklore you always need an infinite number of degrees of freedom is not necessary. This is a, a contradiction to that. This is an anomaly that you can compute exactly even with a finite number of points in your lattice or a finite number of degrees of freedom in general. So it's amusing from that perspective. Um, okay. So now I think, okay, so let's imagine gauging this U1 gamma now to get some constraints on the theory. Yeah. Uh, when you say you can detect this Z4 anomaly, I suppose the Z4 has a normal subgroup of Fermat parity. Is that right? It has a, sorry? It has a normal subgroup, which is Fermat parity minus one F. X on the. Uh, well, I gave you what the Z4 does. It takes uh, one of my lattice fields into I gamma times the field. Right. And I suppose the. the, the, the... So it's, it's a bit like spin Z4 symmetry or chiral fermion parity or something like that. Yes, it's, it's analogous to that, certainly. But the remember, we're acting on Kähler Dirac fields, not vial fields. The square of this generator gives you fermion parity operator minus one. F. Yeah, I think that's right. Okay, but, but then let me make sure, in order to detect this anomaly, which manifold are you putting on? Usually you will require some structure, you know, spin times Z4, mod Z2 structure. Don't need any structure. I just need to be a simplicial manifold with a, right, so. But, but how do you know, how do you detect the phase, like uh, the EI2 pi over four? So what I, this is why I'm getting back to the question earlier. I, I do need to be able to define it as an oriented triangulation. So I have to go through the lattice and be able to cons assign a cis consistent orientation. So I'm not sure about the statement of what happens for a non-orientable manifold. But that's the only structure I need. It has to just be an orientable triangulation. I don't need a spin connection. I don't need a notion of local Lorentz frame. Right. Right. But but how do you read the, the anomaly? Maybe just from this from the, the this slide. How, how do you see the anomaly? For example, what do you know the classification or do you know what are the terms? I am what I'm doing here is analogous to the usual textbook calculation of the ABJ anomaly, right? I look at the action, it's invariant, I look at the measure. And the measure is not invariant, but it's trivially not invariant in the sense I can see it immediately where it's coming from, right? It's just a counting exercise. I have a certain number of discrete points, links, triangles in the lattice. They transform oppositely by an opposite phase under this particular transformation. And I'm just counting how many there are of them all. Yes. And then just, you know, I just automatically get the Euler character. But can you tell the phase is the, this imaginary eye out of this path integral major change? Like EI two pi over four. So I'm just so I get e to the two i chi. Chi is two for the sphere, so that's e to the four i, 
So that tells me it's Z4, right? It's two pi over four. I see. No problem. That's Thank you. Yes. Yeah, good. Sorry. That's good. All right. Sorry. Yeah, so it's a very easy calculation in the on the lattice. So anyway, let, let's think about gauging it for a moment now. Of course, if I did that, the theory would no longer be gauge invariant. And this would be an example of, of course, a Toft anomaly. Um, but if I think about gauging this U1 gamma for the Kähler Dirac equation, that's rather that's basically equivalent to coupling the theory to a reduced Kähler Dirac theory, right? Because I use the gamma as a projector to go from Kähler Dirac down to reduced Kähler Dirac. If I gauging this U1 gamma is equivalent to coupling the theory to a reduced Kähler Dirac theory on a curved space. So those theories in general will be inconsistent, right? Because they will not, you will violate gauge invariance by this anomaly. All right. And sort of similar to what happens with Dirac fermions, there is a way out of here. You can realize this theory, this two n dimensional theory, this even dimensional theory as the boundary of some odd dimensional manifold where the anomaly vanishes. All right. And so that's what we'll do in a moment. We'll just see how to work, make this work in the case of bound two dimensional boundary fermions, Kähler Dirac fermions realized on a domain wall of a 3D theory. But the thing generalizes to any odd dimensions in the end. So, so let me step it, on the path to that. Let me let me discuss Kähler Dirac fermions in three dimensions now, because there's some interesting things that come up in connection to that. So if I think about the number of Grassmann components I need for a Kähler Dirac uh, field in three dimensions, then I have then the total number of fields is eight, right? Because I have scalar, vector, um, do all of that vector. And, and and three form, all right? So, so uh, zero, one, two, and three forms, right? So the total number of components I need to, to capture in my in my field is eight. So when I told you before I can get the matrix fermion by expanding over products of gamma matrices, that won't work if I use the minimal gamma matrix in three dimensions, which is a two by two matrix, right? Which is the Pauli matrices. So I'm forced immediately to accommodate this Kähler Dirac theory. I have to use four by four gamma matrices right from the get-go. I can reduce the number of components down, so they would naturally have 16 components. I can go to a reduced Kähler Dirac field in three dimensions right away by projection using the, the appropriate um, uh, projector matrix in, in 4D. Uh, but then I'll naturally inherit a spin four flavor symmetry. So the three-dimensional theory I, I tried to construct will naturally have a spin four uh, flavor symmetry from the get-go. Just by it's just forced on you by trying to accommodate the, all the fields you need in, in terms of a matrix. So if I want to map my Kähler Dirac theory into a theory of spinners, I'm forced to use four component spinners and not two component spinners, which you would naively think. So that has some advantages. So if I start writing the action down in terms of uh, four. Uh, three dimensions, I'll have, of course, some covariant derivatives, some frames again, like before. But now, because I'm in four by in a four by four basis, I have a mass term I can write down proportional to gamma four. That wasn't an option in even dimensions, but now it is. And this, so this whole operator still anti-commutes uh, with the gamma operator that I can define in, in three dimensions. So this reduced k rack theory can be written down in three dimensions using these four by four matrices. And in fact, one good way to understand where this action comes from, I think, is to start from four dimensions, um, go to high temperature, there'll be a dimensional reduction to three dimensions where the mass scale that arises for the fermions because they satisfy anti-periodic boundary conditions so it will just be related to the length in the four dimensions. So you can think of this as an effective action resulting at high temperature from a four dimensional fermion theory. And then it's very natural that all of these spin connections and, and frames are sort of valued in spin four. So you're sort of forced to do this as soon as you want to try to find a spinner representation of your Kähler Dirac field in three dimensions. You're forced to actually, in the end, construct a theory with spin four invariance, not just spin three, as you might have guessed. So that, that's the first take on point. All right. Um, but I can go and integrate the, that. Now I have a mass in the theory. I can integrate those Kähler Dirac fermions out in the large mass limit. Oh, let me get rid of this. Um, and so what I find at one loop level, and perhaps this isn't surprising at all, is a Chern Simons theory for the spin four gauge field that I introduced. 
right? So I started down with, the, I was formulating my theory on a curved background. I ended up with a non-trivial spin four connection. When I integrate the fermions out at one loop, I find exactly uh, a Chern-Simons term for this spin four gauge field, omega, capital omega, all right? And again, the coefficient just depends on the magnitude, uh, on the sign of the mass, not on its magnitude. So it's actually mass independent up to a sign. This, this is not a new story, of course. Something precisely analogous happens when I take Dirac fermions in odd dimensions and integrate them out. Typically with an internal symmetry, I get a Chern-Simons term induced. The difference here is that this particular spin four Chern-Simons theory has an interesting gravity in interpretation. I can take the spin connection, omega, and expand it out on uh, the usual spin three connection and then the additional generator. So I decompose it on a spin three subgroup and the additional generators can actually build the frame field for you dynamically. So this is really a kind of generalization of Witten's construction of the connection between two plus one gravity and Chern-Simons theory, right? So this is a sort of a generalization of that. It's not new. It's been around again since the 1980s. People understood how to write down gravitational Chern-Simons theories for a long time. What's interesting here is I naturally arrive at these sort of topological gravitational theories by integrating out Kähler Dirac fields in odd dimensions. All right, so I get an sort of induced topological gravity theory just by reinterpreting basically the symbols in the original spin four Chern-Simons action. All right, so you can play this game in any odd dimensions. It doesn't have to be three. So it's true in five, seven, nine, whatever you want. You always have a Chern-Simons term. You can always decompose that Chern-Simons term into a series of spin connections and frames um, according to subgroups of the original um, spin symmetry. And so, that, so, it's, so it's interesting that you end up with gravity by integrating these guys out in odd dimensions. Um, all right. Actually, question. Sure. Uh, there are actually two. One is earlier, but let me ask, uh, how do you regard things as uh, with topological gravity? For example, do you consider something like no massless spin two excitations as topological gravity? So or, I think the thing that, I mean, the thing that makes the connection to real gravity, it looks to me like, you know, when you glance at this last line here, it looks like you've derived Einstein-Hilbert gravity from this Chern-Simons theory, right? What makes it less clear you've really done that is that the assumption to connect the two is that the, the frame is invertible, right? So the Chern-Simons theory, you integrate over all frames, all, all gauge connections. And so you'll necessarily in, in, include configurations where the, the frame vanishes, where the gauge field is zero, right? That can't be mapped into a metric theory of gravity. That's what basically renders the theory topological rather than an actual physical theory of gravity. I mean, here in three dimensions, it's always topological, right? But, but in five dimensions, for example, if you did the same kind of construction, um, then, then the theory you're getting from this Chern-Simons theory is strictly topological in the sense that you, by definition, you, you are integrating over connections which, which are not invertible in places, right? In field space. So that's what makes the connection to, to a purely metric-based gravity somewhat formal. It's a connection at the level of the action, but in converting between these two actions, I have to you know, invert the field, uh, the, the dry bind in this case, right? And that's not always possible. That, you know, the, you, normally when one talks about gravity, one talks about connections which are, uh, sorry, metrics which are non-singular, for which the metric never vanishes. The Chern-Simons theory includes places where the metric vanishes as well. Um, so this is why I think Witten no longer believes two plus one gravity is a churn simons series because of that, that mismatch, right? So not, this is really sort of a side issue for what we're talking about here. It's, it's true that when you integrate Kähler Dirac fields out, you get these churn simons gravity theories. Their interpretation and discussion of why they're, whether really gravity or whether it's topological gravity is a secondary issue. It's a sort of a side issue. Uh, it's not something we need to weigh in, discuss much here. It's certainly something that's caused a lot of discussion in the literature over the years. So Witten originally proposed it as a Chern-Simons theory, then backed off on it later on for the reasons I've just gone through. Um, I, I don't know where that's really addressing your question. Well, it helps things. Another thing is that it seems earlier the Keller de Rohr theory is non-chiral. Slightly one how can you carry the spin times z4 mar z2 symmetry anomaly 
in that case, it seems like uh, the symmetry need to act on the fermions in the chiral way. So perhaps the index earlier one show you you show there mm -hmm. that, that's all the fermions. Actually, this, this, are you talking about something on this slide or something further back? Well, maybe further back. Just uh, when you try to say there is a gravitational Somewhere around here, right? So so you say the fermions was act by the z four symmetry in mm -hmm. a chiral. So, well, it, it's analogous to a chiral operator. I mean, it's acting on these k Dirac fields, which ultimately represent, if I do it naively in flat space, a vector-like theory, right? Because they are, it's, for example, in four dimensions, you can decompose the single reduced k Dirac field to two Dirac fermions or four Majorana, right? If it's a real right. representation. But so, so this operator acts naturally on a collection, a, 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 a package of fermions, which is vector-like. Right, but the symmetry will need to be, need to act on the fermions in the chiral so way. Have to, so you have to do a little bit more to actually get down to a chiral theory, I think. Even from a reduced fermion, even from a reduced Kelly-Rack fermion, it's not naturally immediately chiral, right? Because it contains within it left and right-handed components. Now it's a it's I'll say a little bit more at the very end about this so it's to how you make that next connection to so a chiral field because of course that's a main motivation for me. Right. Right. And I, I suppose you are also getting the index full in you know, a nominee of Z16, correct? Here. So you have a full full uh, So well you had, you read yeah, a you have you a Z4 it. symmetry and you have to really argue that the anomalies in that Z4 symmetry force you to uh, 16 Majorana, say, or 16 violin four dimensions, right? Right, yeah. Right. It but certainly it's... allows you to write down four fermion interactions and not to write down bilinears, right? Yeah. I, I think I, I get I get a, what yeah. you have here, yeah. You, you okay. read the index for in the Z16. And... So, so the, by the way, there is an index theorem associated with this anomaly. It says the index of D minus D dagger is equal to chi, the Euler character. So I think it's actually known to mathematicians that there is index theorem for, for the Kähler Dirac operator. They don't call it the Kähler Dirac operator, but I think this is actually well known to mathematicians. Okay. okay, thanks. By the way, there is something block the upper corner of the slides if you want to. Yeah, let's get rid of that. Sorry. Yeah. Put that away. That's not... yeah, yes, thanks. Yeah. Okay. But actually more interesting perhaps to this audience is, is the connection to sort of topological insulators and things like that. So I can play a, the usual game where I put a domain wall into the system, into this three-dimensional system. And what you'll find, perhaps not surprisingly, is I get massless edge modes or massless fields localized to the wall, which turn out to be reduced k Dirac fields. Um, and they transform under their unbroken symmetry, spin four breaks down to spin two cross spin two basically local Lorentz transformations on the wall and an additional U1 symmetry, which is related to gamma, basically. So the Lagrangian for the two-dimensional theory that appears um, contains an interesting structure. It's, it's, it contains a full Kähler Dirac field, but it's only um, coupled to gravity through its sort of minus component. So a single reduced component couples to gravity. The other one is free. Right, and the projection here that's used to do this plus minus separation now is built out of an effective gamma five hat, which is the product of the gamma one and gamma two that you started with. So I remember I started in, in, a, in a theory which had four dimensional gamma matrices. So I take products gamma one, gamma two, and again, an effective gamma five hat, which acts on the domain wall fermions um, and leads to a coupling of a single reduced two-dimensional reduced Kähler rack field to a U1 field, which comes from omega 3, 4, all right? So again, naively, this is a coupling of a reduced two-dimensional Kähler rack field to gravity, and it's anomalous. So it would not be gauge invariant by itself. But as, as you expect, what happens is, because it, this is embedded in a three-dimensional theory, which is anomaly free, what happens is, um, there's an anomaly inflow effect from bulk churn Simon's term, such that the theory in the end is gauge invariant. So the variation under a gauge transformation here associated with this U1 field cancels against something from the bulk, right? So this, this is a, an example of how you can formulate 
a gravitationally coupled reduced k dot Dirac theory um, in a non-anomalous way by realizing it as a boundary, or in this case, a domain wall of this higher dimensional system. It's completely analogous to what happens with Dirac fermions yielding vial fermions on the boundary of a topological insulator with anomaly inflow, ensuring those things are well-defined. So I think this, it's just completely analogous to that, all right? And it has to happen because the anomaly vanishes in odd dimensions. So the higher dimensional theory doesn't have an anomaly. So there has to be a cancellation between the bulk and the boundary, right? So it's largely the usual story for topological insulators, but now sort of rephrased and, and spe spe specific to this particular k dot rac representation of fermion using this new, if you want, symmetry gamma associated with gamma. So it's not, it's all this twisted chiral symmetry version of the usual story. Okay. So this analysis generalizes to any dot odd dimension. So gravity theories of this type exist in, in two n plus one dimensions. And if you put boundaries or domain walls into them, you will get localized boundary k dot Dirac fields. Um, those are reduced fields, actually. It doesn't say that, but and those anom the anomaly from those guys is canceled by anomaly inflow from the bulk gravity theory. So gravity saves the theory on the boundary in this case. Um, and so you can get reduced k dot Dirac theories this way, consistent theories this way. Um, and so it, as I said before, it mimics the usual arguments for vial fermions as edge modes of topological insulators. So, so it's an amusing kind of a generalization or extension of the, the, the normal situation uh, for topological insulators. Um, what time is it, Yuvan? I have no idea what time. Am I? Oh, I'm, I'm using my time, Aponte. All right, well, I'm nearly finished actually, so we can probably get quickly through this. Um, so these edge states can be gapped using Z4 symmetric four fermion interactions, and that's what the staggered fermion model did at the beginning. Of course, the minimal number I need is four, and so that since a two-dimensional reduced field in flat space describes two Majorana fermions, that will give me a total of eight in the end uh, that I would, if I decomposed it into spinners, that, that will be the field content of my spinner theory. In four dimensions, each reduced field I told you to describes four Majoranas. So again, I have four times four equals 16 in total. So the, 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 the counting of fermions agrees with what you expect from topological insulators, uh, using Dirac and vial fermions. And it also agrees with the cancellation of discrete anomalies for things like chiral fermion parity and spin Z4 symmetry and vial for vial fermions in, in two and four dimensions too. So this is the content of, I guess, of the Dieffried theorem. So this, this uh, so what I'm it's kind of, yeah. Excuse me, uh, can I have a question? Uh, you oh. talk, uh, yeah, you are talking about uh, top topological insulator. So mm -hmm. in that case, usually we require time reversal symmetry. So right. in your case, we also require time reversal symmetry? No. So what I'm saying is this Z4 symmetry of Kähler Dirac fermions is somehow mopping up the effects of chiral fermion parity or time reversal in different numbers of dimensions for vial fermions. I see. So you only need a Z4 symmetry. Yes. So somehow the Kähler Dirac theory um, has its own unique anomaly structure and satisfying that anomaly structure in any dimension and seems to give me the counting that I get from various different discrete symmetries for vial or Majorana fermions. I think that that's kind of my conclusion is that somehow packing your fermions into a Kähler Dirac field, coupling them to gravity, extracting the anomaly structure out of that and using anomaly cancellation constraints to get rid of the total anomalies there gives you the same output, if you want, as starting with these different discrete symmetries like time reversal invariants. And, and requiring cancellation of, of anomalies for that. It seems yeah, to but, uh, but uh, for the case of uh, topological insulator, we need a three-dimensional bulk with the both time reversal and uh, U1 charge conservation. Yeah. So here, what's the total global symmetry in addition to this Z4? Or you well, only require Z4 uh, symmetry? I, I only really, re the only one that plays a role, I think, is the Z4. I mean, there are, there are I showed you a model with SO4 symmetry in addition and things like that at the beginning. But as far as I understand it, I just need the Z4, the U1 breaking to Z4, and then the Z4. Yeah, but, uh, but if there's only Z4 symmetry, I think there's no interest in Fermionica SPT phase. The, if we just compute this Z4 non perturbative anomaly, there's nothing, I think. Uh, in, in four parts 1D, yes, because, because these are like a 40, four parts 1D bulk. Oh, he, he's talking about uh, four plus one. Not yeah, remember, we're in different numbers. Okay, okay. <laughs> we have different dimensions, okay. meanings of what we mean by dimension here. I see. My, my dimensions are all Euclidean, so they all include time. So that's uh, 
Yeah, but in a four plus one case, how do we reduce to the two plus one the boundary? So yeah, I'm oh no, I, the the example I gave you is in two plus one reducing to two. Oh, I see, I see. Uh, but it would work just as well in four plus one reducing to four. I see, I see. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I, I think for like a sentence terminology will be this will just be uh at the some z2 symmetry x squared equal to minus one f x is unitary i think in your paper for example with the chinra if you go further to four plus one d you will get the same class of the z16 anomaly and possibly we unless my people will just call this some symmetry volatility state spd so because yeah yeah so what's the uh, uh german what's the total global symmetry just a z4 tensor so, product of z2f yeah z4 extend from normal z2f by a z2 unitary symmetry a non-trivial extension to z4 oh so, so it's it's a z4f z4f yes you will call I see, I see. okay thanks yeah. i think i understand what you're saying yeah okay again I, I, my language is not yours but i i think we're talking about similar things yeah, the same thing yeah. but i, I think yeah. somehow these killer rack guys in the flat space limit are packaging up a bunch of information that you could have gotten from other symmetries using vile or myrona that's my reading of it it's not like you're getting a different result. You're getting the same result from a different kind of anomaly. I think. Yes. It's funny that it's gravitational, but then I can set the flat space limit and decompose it into spinners, conventional spinners. Yeah, so, so these are the same, this is in class, the people studying from T square equal to minus one F. These are X square equal to minus one F, but T is anti-unitary in three plus one. Symmetry, the time reversal symmetry here, the four plus one x is unitary symmetry. Right. I, I, so, think I, I think we're talking the same. Same thing. Yeah, I think so. All right, let me, I, I can almost wrap up here if you'd like me to. Uh, I'm almost out of my hour and a half. Um, and, or I could say a couple more words, but it, you know. So this Keller Dirac equation is some alternative to the Dirac equation. And in flat space, it just describes multiples of degenerate Dirac fermions. So it's not terribly interesting. It's intimately connected to staggered fermions and explains why staggered fermions describe multiples of Dirac fermion too. And that's the way I like to think about staggered fermions, not the conventional way of thinking about them. Um, however, that when you couple it to gravity, when, and when you think about the theory in curved space, this equivalence is not true. Um, there's a new gravitational anomaly in the game, which, which breaks this U1 to Z4. Crucially, that anomaly survives discretization, and that's the reason these staggered Fermi models have the structure they do. They know about anomaly cancellation and POFT anomalies from the continuum. And, and so they're able to realize new phases of the theory, basically, because of that. Um, the, the most recent work really is, is this stuff in odd dimensions, where we can see now how to write down consistent theories of reduced scalar Dirac fermions coupled to gravity um, and, and using sort of this topological insulator type picture. And it looks like you need uh, the number of reduced scalar arc fields to be a multiple of four to cancel off anomalies and also to be consistent with four Fermi interactions. Um, okay, so that's really, um, but this construction generalizes for any number of odd dimensions. So it's not tied to the one example I gave you. Um, speculation. So let me just speculate just for a little bit. So this agreement between the Kedar Dirac fermions and the vial and conventional vial fermions using. It, that we see um, in terms of the counting of fermions and the anomaly cancellations that are going on, together with the fact that this twisted chiral symmetry survives on the lattice, makes one think or suggest that somehow these lattice Kata Dirac fields could provide some sort of avenue, more general avenue to construct chiral lattice gates there is. So that's been sort of been my driving motivation for a while. I don't think I have a full solution to this yet. But that's the idea is that somehow if you formulate your theories in terms of Keda Dirac or possibly staggered fermions with the right representations and the right field content, you have a chance of gapping mirror states, the kind of things that Yuvan was talking about before, and ending up with a low energy spectrum, which is truly chiral. At least there's some hope of doing it using these sort of ideas. You know, so just anyway, to, yes. A question, again, there, because earlier you say the Keda Dirac a vector like theory. Right. But then how do you get a chiral symmetry X on those? So that's the question. Um, so, so let me just, maybe this slide answers, you, uh, answers your question, right? So we all know the naive lattice approach to, to mirror models fails basically, or rather we, the naive lattice approach to chiral fermions fails because of fermion doubling. 
right? Mirror models try to give masses to some of those states without touching the other guys. That's been very hard to do over the years until perhaps very recently. There's some new work by, by Wen, DeMarco, Yuvan, and other people that are, uh, that, that are claiming this, is, this problem has been solved in one plus one dimensions for certain constructions, for certain models. Um, what I'm claiming is that, you know, the idea here is that you can use this phenomenon of symmetric mass generation to try to gap out the doublers. And that's very much the spirit of these papers too. All right. And so you can write down invariant four fermion terms that can generate cutoff scale masses for mirror fermions, remove them from the physics and leave just the fermions you want. Um, a necessary condition for symmetric mass generation is you have to cancel off the total anomalies. That's what we understand now. And that's perhaps what was not well understood uh, in the early days uh, when people tried to make mirror models of lattice fermions. Um, and so, so the question is, if I embed my vial fields in some sort of reduced K.Dirac field, and I try to get the usual conventional gamma phi from this funny capital gamma, which is sort of a direct product of two different gamma fives by some appropriate set of interactions, can I, can I ensure that at least in the continuum limit that I do what I want to do? And I don't have a concrete construction which necessarily will work for this. Um, but this is, the, this is the suggestion that these, this might offer a route or a, an, a, a, you know, a mechanism to try to realize you know, something like a chiral lattice gauge theory using these kinds of constraints. And it will be very constrained, by the way. You, this is not going to necessarily work generically, but th that's the idea. And so anyway, I think I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Simon, for Exactly using 90 minutes. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Uh, any question from the audience? Please feel free. Uh, excuse me. Uh, you also mentioned the example of uh, two plus one debug, right? With the same symmetry. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah but uh, uh, for two plus one, if the symmetry, if the symmetry is Z4, Z4F. So, I so, so. Can... In two plus one, I would claim there is no anomaly naively, right? In odd dimensions, if I use an odd dimensional sphere, the Euler character vanishes. So my entire theory is anomaly free, but I'm trying to realize even dimensional boundary theories, which-, which I, I think uh, I think Zhenchen was saying the two plus one D in one extra dimension to read the anomaly in one plus one D, your big capital D equal to two. That's oh, my capital, so my capital D was equal to two. two. Really? Yes, that's what, what Jensen asked. So he, Jensen was asking two plus one D bulk. Yes, yeah, three three D bulk. Yeah. Yes. So that's the that's let's see, go back. Uh, that's, where's my else? Let's go back there. Somewhere around here. So this this is exactly when I say three dimensions, I mean two plus one here. Right. So in this case it's anomaly free, right? It's anomaly free in the bulk. I see, I see. So okay. what that's that's precisely why you get anomaly. So you can construct, you can put a domain wall into the system or a boundary. There will be now uh, massless fields on the edge modes or domain wall modes. Those guys potentially have an anomaly, but it'll be canceled from inflow from the bulk chain diamonds. That's why there has to be a bulk chain diamonds. So so the minimum dimension to get this anomaly is four plus one. Mm -hmm. If we are interested in, yeah, in. Okay in four dimensions, i.e. three plus one. <laughs> right. Okay, thanks. Yes, exactly, yeah. But, but this, the structure will go through. We haven't done the calculation because there's more diagrams. Um, so in our paper, we just did three plus, two plus one, just to be simple. Um, there's a, there, and there are only two diagrams to worry about then at the one loop level. Um, but the structure that you get, it, this one follows from that. Simon, I have a question. Sure. Uh, so, naively in the in the context of ah, it's Newman. I can recognize your voice. I don't see you on my screen. Yeah. Uh, naively, the the continuum limit for pure fermionic theories, or or in the sense of uh, condensed matter theories like topological insulators, the continuum limit is like a low energy effective theory. That that's what is meant by the condensed matter theorists. Yeah, mm -hmm. but for a chiral lattice gauge theory, the trouble is that the continuum limit is tightly tied with the with the coupling. So, how how do you reconcile? Like, if 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 you have a theory which is which is a gauge theory which is vector like on the lattice, mm -hmm. and we want to 
take the continuum limit so that we end up with a chiral theory in the continuum. So the naive continuum limit for the for the fermions and for the gauge fields are like they don't go along with each other. No. Well, I mean, I mean, you're really asking, I, I think what you're getting at is that these reduced k Dirac fields still describe vector-like theories. And the question is, what form of interaction will separate the left from the right-handed modes within a reduced field? Yeah, yes. Right, and, and, that, and it has to separate it perfectly, right? I mean, uh, and this is one of the issues with all these domain wall constructions. When you move the left-handed fermions to one boundary and the right-handed fermions to another boundary, if those boundaries are separated by a finite amount, in general, there's some residual mass, which is an overlap between those two boundaries, right? Mm -hmm. If that overlap is anything non-zero, you have a problem, right? It has to be strictly zero. That, that's always been part of the problem in, when people tried to do this many years ago, is there was always an overlap between the two boundary modes. That gave you a residual mass, which was small, which is why people use domain wall fermions for QCD, because it it, it does yield effectively very small masses, but it wasn't zero. And so what you really need with these new ideas is to make sure that, that, that you've really removed the mirror states completely, that there's no overlap what left with the, the fermions on the other boundary, that the, you know, it's the Hilbert space sort of factorizes. And, and showing that rigorously is non-trivial, I think. Uh -huh. I mean, that, that's the heart of, you know, if these new ideas are, are to be useful, they have to resolve that problem that goes back a long time. People tried to do this a long time ago. After some years, they gave up because they didn't figure out how to do this. One okay. thing they didn't know about was symmetric mass generation, right? So this is the new sort of idea, set of ideas. One, 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 uh, one caveat of the domain wall approach is that you still have gauge fields in the bulk. Yeah. And they can couple the modes on, on, on those two different boundaries unless... Well, you have to make sure the boundaries are separately and normally free by themselves to decouple them at all. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they will necessarily be coupled through the bulk because of the anomaly constraints, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have another question. Looks like somebody has a hand up. Yeah. Um, so, hi, this is maybe hi. a naive hi. question, but um, is there maybe um, an operator or in a more broad sense, an observable that can distinguish between Dirac and Keller Dirac uh, particles, I mean, for example, transport or some kind of density. Um, that's a good question. I mean, they 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 the only way they really differ strongly uh, is through the gravitational interactions. So that means you know it's ver it it be. You have to come up with something, you know, imagine an experiment which would distinguish the gravitational interactions, I think. And offhand, I'm not sure. That would probably be a very hard experiment to do because I think most of the dif difference would, you know, be suppressed by powers of the Planck scale or something like that. But nice. um, the, this is discussed a little bit in an old paper from 1982 by Tom Banks. So there's a paper called Geometric Fermions, which explicitly talks about, proposes Kähler Dirac fermions. And in fact, it proposes them as actually a solution to the family problem. So back then we didn't know there were only three families, right? So he was proposing there was a fourth and it was not that this, this fourfold degeneracy of the Kähler Dirac equation was precisely reflecting that. In other words, the, the, all the gauge interactions per flavor were just the same, and you, but you had a fourfold replication. And there's some discussion in that paper about uh, the sort of kind of question I think you're getting at, which is how you would distinguish, suppose the world were populated by Kähler Dirac fermions. We didn't know it because we always decompose them into spinners in any local region of spacetime. Um, you know, and how would you distinguish the two? Um, and so there are some comments in that paper, which... But if I think about it in terms of a lattice, then yep. these effects will be more... Traumatic. Um, right, more pronounced. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. So you're, um, well, I mean, this also partly gets to the heart of, you know, when people do lattice QCD with staggered fermions, they always have to work very hard to construct continuum direct spinners and, and, and continuum observables from the staggered fields. Because partly because they're naturally describing Kähler Dirac fields, not Dirac fields. And I think that's part of the reason they have to work so hard 
to, you know, because what happens is the different spinner and flavor components of the continuum fermion are spread around the unit cell in the lattice. So they're carried by different components of the staggered fields. And so there's always a, a huge enterprise to connect, to extract information about Dirac fermions out of staggered fermions, you know, staggered simulations, if you want. Um, but I, I don't, yeah, I don't have, have anything specific to say in terms of what you would measure, which would tell you you had one or the other. I think if generically you measure in a lattice simulation with staggered fermions, your, your, the natural observables you would write down, the most obvious ones, will turn out to tell you something about the Kähler Dirac theory, not directly about the Dirac theory. You have to work harder to extract Dirac physics out of it, I'd say. Okay, thanks. I, I still have the question, uh, sure. how do you impose the chiral symmetry on the vector-like KLD raw fermion? And I think that part really is, is changing the vector-like KLD raw theory to a, a chiral theory. So, the so sense, let me... Let, let in me... that sense, I think you reinterpret those D raw fermion in terms of a double, double version of the, for example, all left-handed while fermions. In that case, you already change the theory to uh, chiral like so you can read the anomaly index in a non-trivial way. Otherwise, the anomaly will be trivial, zero, if you have a vector symmetry, Z for X on left and right in the same way. I think you should X on the left, for example, with uh, mm -hmm. multiple symmetry charge one on the right, charge minus one. And in that case, the left and right can be flipped in a sense you can flip all the vial fermions to the left-handed and then you will get a chiral symmetry and you can read the anomaly index. And what, what confused me is that it seems like you can read the non-trivial anomaly index, but you say the theory is vector-like. I think this- Well, it's, 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 the anomaly is not the associated with the usual gamma five, the one I've been talking about, right? It's not the same. Okay. So right. gamma so doesn't generate the usual gamma five chiral symmetry. Right, so maybe you already impose a chiral I, either you review the theory as a chiral symmetry or you change the vector theory to a chiral theory. Either way, I think uh, I think just just there you already you already have a chiral theory. So what you really need is another constraint. I've told you about projection down to reduce the Kähler Dirac theory, right? Uh -huh. That still yields a vector like theory. I completely agree. Right. So the question is, is there some way to take a reduced Kähler Dirac field and project it one more time? to get out one of its left or right-handed pieces. Mm -hmm. Now, the only way I can think of doing that right now is the following. When you project to a reduced field, what you're really starting is, I start with a, a Kähler Dirac field, which is sums over even and odd forms. And when I project down to reduced Fermi, and I just say retain just the even forms, right? That's basically what's happening. You're, you're, you're throwing out the odd forms and keeping only even forms, right? For psi, for the for for the for the field, but I could imagine also putting an additional constraint, which is not, I think, possible for Dirac fermions. Which is, I can say, well, originally I tr I thought this field was complex, it was a complex set of p forms. What stops me now just telling taking it as real? Right, that will cut down the number of degrees of freedom further, and it basically amounts to imposing some sort of charge conjugation condition on the Kähler Dirac matrix. Right, and that will allow you to turn right-handed fields into left-handed fields. Mm -hmm. So I think that my thinking at the moment, and I can't convince myself that this is going to work, is that you need to impose additional condition, which will be some sort of reality condition on the Kähler Dirac fermions, which will allow me to write relate left to right. Mm -hmm. and so I then it's not so maybe what I don't what I don't do is take the right and put them up to the cutoff, but I try to turn the rights into left with the right representations. Mm -hmm. And this was kind of part of that paper I wrote a year or so ago, which I think is, I don't know whether it's right or not, but it, it's, that seems to be the only way I can think of doing this. You mm -hmm. have to gap out some of the fermions on the wrong wall, but in addition, you have to do this, you have to do something else to reduce field that's left. And it seems to put constraints on the fermion content too. I mean, the, the representations and things like that. Right, because I need to be able to impose a sort of generalized charge conjugation condition on the matrix, which I think is basically the same 
as imposing a reality condition on the Kehler Dirac field, which I didn't use in projection. In projection, I just restricted to say even forms. I can then say I want real even forms. And then, I, then if I look at the matrix representation of that, that looks to, that's equivalent, I think, to basically turning right-handed fermions into left-handed fermions, at least in four dimensions. Mm -hmm. um, so so yeah, that's my guess. This is not a, an, a, a rigorous argument. It's just my thinking at the moment. Right, but can I make sure? So in your page 13, I think, with the, the, the yeah. page 13. Oh, on my paper or? Wait, wait, what page 13 of the slide. Okay. The slide. Uh, I could if I can get advanced there. there, we go. there we go. Uh -huh. So do you already regard the theory as full left-handed biofermions here? No. So this, no? No. I mean, this is even a full Kehler Dirac field. So this is, um, you know, four Dirac fermions packaged together in flat space. Of course, I'm not in flat space when I'm doing this, but that's the idea. So, so you will have uh, eight biofermions and full left and full right? Yeah. But but uh, in that case, I just confused then, how can you read the anomaly index out of a vector theory? I think only chiral theory has this non-trivial index. Because you are reading from the past integral major, maybe you read the a, a Z4 class. Oh, sorry, the, the Z4 subgroup out of Z16. So I suppose it's like index four in 16. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying anything about your Z classification. I'm saying here's a symmetry with the action the measure uh -huh. is clearly not invariant to that symmetry. And I can even, you know, so I'm just computing how the measure changes. Uh, and that is an anomaly as far as I'm concerned. I don't, it's not a chiral anomaly in the usual sense. I totally agree. Okay. It, it's an anomaly for this U1 symmetry of Kehler Dirac fermions. So you, you went. Uh... Yeah, I'm trying to understand better. I mean, so I think there's an index theorem here. It says the index of D minus D dagger, the exterior derivative minus its adjoint equals chi. Yes, let, let me say the following. I, I think uh, my understanding is that if you already have a Keller Dirac theory in the manner such that you already produce a chiral fermions, uh, as the way I understand was the anomaly index, non-trivial anomaly index here, perhaps you don't even need to gap the mirror doubling because this theory already is a chiral and possibly so Possibly, yeah, I, 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 I've struggled with the same thing. If you, uh, um, you do need to make it the boundary of something because otherwise you have gauge anomalies to worry about. But what's, but then it may be a question of projecting your reduced fermion down one more step, which may be a question of taking the right fermion. So that's what I was getting back to before. It's not even clear to me that you have to worry too much about the mirror fermions. You may turn the right handed mirror fermions into left handed fermions. If you can impose an additional condition on the Kehler Dirac field, I guess that's, I sort of, I, I sort of see what you're saying, and I've kind of had the same thoughts myself. I think does that make sense? So this, this is, this is not a chiral anomaly yet, or, but, but it does constrain um, the nature of the interactions I can write down, okay. and I think I need further constraints to get to a truly chiral theory, okay. and it, maybe I can only achieve that in the continuum limit, perhaps as well. Um, I'm not sure it has to happen at finite lattice spaces. But yeah. I, okay. I, I think uh, my, yeah, maybe no one has a comment, but let me just finish the statement I make. I want to make if you have a full D rock fermion, right? For this Keller D rock theory, if you are able to gain the anomaly counting, if I interpret correctly, let me think just for a moment. It's just something that's a bit weird. Yeah, I think something is hidden in the style. Maybe you didn't present, so I guess something not quite correct. Because the uh, if you have a full Dirac fermion, and now if you read the index full in the Z16, it seems like you are projecting half of the degree freedom when you do the calculation, I guess, because you probably already project half of the full Dirac fermions, right? Maybe you just get two. So I mean, point, then I have all four. I have a phi and a phi bar. Right, which is basically the counting for four. That's why okay. I get these factors of two upstairs. If I if I did this for a reduced Kehler Dirac theory formally, I would only I would lose these factors of two because I'd only have an integral of a phi to do. Okay. Um, yeah. But then I, I can't regulate that theory. It's like the usual story with the vial fermions. If I use a reduced Kehler Dirac theory, I can't write a mass term down, at least for one flavor. 
Okay. So, I, you know, I have these expressions to, so it's a bit more delicate, I think. Yeah. I don't I think know how to regulate that theory, I guess. I, I think the punchline is that if you have a left-handed valve fermion with charge one under the Z4, I should get an index one in Z16, as you know. So I'm just counting how many fermions you have to match this index. In some way, I think uh, the theory needs to be chiral in order to match non-trivial index. And, and I don't quite understand your point, but maybe, I don't know whether we no, me, me, continue no, this I, offline, but no, I mean, no, no, you no, may no, be no, saying no, something no. which is very relevant for the thing that confuses me, but I, I'm just not sure of the language. No, I, also, I also try to understand better, no, no problem. I have no question about what you did. I just try to understand better. Okay, sure. uh, Norman, please, you have a you have a. Uh, yeah. I, would, I think Simon said the same thing. Uh, so Michael Atia had a paper where he shows that the index of the Kähler Dirac operator d minus d dagger is equal is equivalent to chi. Here, so just who said this, sorry, Norman. This is Atia's paper from 1960s where he shows. Okay, the, all right. So it is well known. I thought so. Okay. It is an index theorem. It's just that the it's just that the reinterpretation of the index in terms of the symmetry is here turns out to be this twisted chiral symmetry. But the one thing is, which is crucial here is that the kähler dirac fermion somehow mixes up this, the Lorentz indices and the flavor indices, and they're entangled in such a way that it's hard to disentangle them. And so this chiral symmetry is like acting on both of them. Sure. So the thing you are uh, like, the way you're visioning it that, oh, I have this gamma five operator and I can, count the n plus and then the plus and mm -hmm. minus and mm -hmm. read the index from there. That I think is tricky here because the operator is like, it's not like the usual chiral operator we have here. It's it's a twisted version where you, where you don't, where the indices are mixed up in such a way that you can't disentangle them. And um, I don't disagree, I think with that. Um... Yeah, thanks. Maybe I can uh, figure how better to apply. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so, so, Newman, uh, uh, so, Yuvan, if, um, I mean, you might be, there's something I don't understand what you, about what you were saying, but maybe if I did understand, it might be helpful. Because um, I don't really understand the Z16 topological classification that you condensed matter guys use all the time. I don't understand what it's, what it's about, I guess, at some point. So, I, maybe there's something I'm missing. Uh, I think this calculation in front of us right now is correct. This, it's trivial um, on the lattice and it's even doable on in the continuum and pretty easily, as you know. So I think this, I mean, there is an index theorem here. It's not the usual one. Um, and the question is, how do I, how can I reduce this theory down to fewer degrees of freedom so I can make contact with a chiral theory and then somehow this anomaly this anomaly has to transfer into the usual chiral anomaly. I guess this is what you're saying, right? And you're saying it should. Yes. And you, uh, so, so, okay, so. Maybe we can figure afterward, but it's already yeah, very. Yeah, we should chat. I mean, I think that we might be finally getting close enough to understanding each other. We might be able to understand this. I mean, at some level, you can forget about chiral symmetry and just say this is an amusing story about Kayla Dirac fermions, period. Right. I mean, clearly my motivation is that I'd like to make this work for chiral fermions too in the end. But, but I agree there is a final step or steps that are missing in that connection. And maybe they're impossible. Maybe this just will never work. Maybe one has to do something different, work directly with the chiral operator from the beginning and not with this twisted guy. I mean, that's possible. Don't worry. I think it's, it's a good, it's inform, 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 informative. Right. Thank you. So let, let us thank uh, Simon for the wonderful seminar. Next time.